wonderful. Good evening to everyone. Uh, Jay Janindra, Namaste, Sasrikal, Assalamu Alaikum. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we have a wonderful event planned for you to, this evening uh, in honor of um, the Nirvan lecture that we are having for the first time in almost three years in person. Um, it celebrates, I believe, 13 or 14 years of our cooperation between the Jane community of South Florida and FIU, the first endowment of Jane studies uh, in North America. So we're very happy and excited that we're able to have and welcome uh, two wonderful uh, performances tonight. <laughs> One academic and one musical. Um, we have Professor uh, Sasha Ristifo, uh, Alexandra Sasha Ristifo, who is joining us this year as the Bhagwan Mahavir Chair for Jane Studies. So we're very excited to have her. She's a tenure track professor in the Department of Religious Studies. Um, and we're also uh, honored to have Ramnik Ji here, who is here from Toronto, who will be performing uh, a live concert um, and the second half of the program. So, I wanted to thank you all um, for the years of collaboration um, that we have had that has been so fruitful. The scores of graduate students that we have graduated from here and the different avenues of exploration that we have opened up in the field of Jane studies, from work that we're doing to establishing new avenues for the study of Jainism in places like Pakistan, to learning more about the history of the Jane community and young Jains in North America. There's so many things that our students have been able to do, and it's been with the gracious support, um, both not just financial, but also sort of intellectual and um, community support of all of these great initiatives that we have, not only in South Florida, but all across the world. And really, FIU and our program here has sent the template for all of the programs all across North America. So Sulekji, everyone, uh, and particularly our friends from JERF, um, and we're really honored to have you all here as well and from South Florida. So with that, what I wanted to do is just uh, very quickly, I know we're, we're starting a little bit late, um, but with that, I wanted to uh, welcome and uh, introduce uh, Samaniji Chaitanya Pragya, who's gonna start us off with a, a benediction. So please, Samaniji. So today, there is 2,555th Maha Anwal Mahavi Nirvan Day. So we are paying our great homage and reverence to the great soul of Mahavir. So we are doing some prayer. <clears throat> okay. Om Namo
at this great occasion i would like to say that jainism which is established in 6th century bce by lord mahavira though mahavir has not just started this movement before him 23 tirthankars were there on the earth and they have started jain religion so mahavir was the last tirthankar who was the 24th tirthankar he was enlightened soul ascetic completely non-violent and spiritual being and he is known as 24th tirthankar of jain tradition today whatever we know in the name of jainism it is taught by him according to his own philosophy we could see that how he has presented very universal concepts regarding the cosmos regarding the life regarding the cosmic process and we see that one french scholar has said something which is very unique we can say the great french scholar louis renou in his 1953 lectures on the religions of india observed that the jain movement presents evidence that is of great interest both for the historical and comparative study of religion in ancient India and for the history of religion in general, based on profoundly Indian elements. It is at the same time a highly original creation containing very ancient material, more ancient than that of Buddhism, and yet highly refined and elaborated. So we can see that these kind of remarks have been given by the uh, French scholar, Louis, and these remarks are certainly well founded. The Jain tradition is not only very old tradition, but it continues to manifest a great number of these, uh, those religious and philosophical elements, which had already made it unique to or some 2,000 to 500 years ago. So this shows that how Jainism has contributed to the world philosophy, world religion, world society and community, and how we can follow his universal messages of non-violence, spirituality, and also universal laws. He talks about so much universal laws which are governing the whole cosmic process. So these kind of philosophy is given by Lord Mahavira and FIU has created such environment to understand these lofty ideas, universal concepts uh, through academic adventure. And uh, this is what we are organizing this kind of events here every year at the occasion of Mahave Nirvan lecture and at the occasion of Mahave Chanti lecture. So this time, uh, Restifo, who is newly appointed here in gender studies as the professor, and we are welcoming her. She has also chosen a very good topic, and it will also show that how Jainism has given new ideas in this field, which is known as false appraisal and quick uh, judgment. So with these words, I, wel I welcome uh, Restifo here for the talk. <laughs> Thank you, Samaniji. And, um, you know, I, I've learned so much from uh, Samaniji Chaitanya and about the Jain tradition um, since I've taken over uh, the directorship of the program. So it's been such an amazing honor to learn from you and to learn from the Jain community, the tradition, and the values that are very applicable um, with the challenges that we face today. So um, I have uh, two more introductions before we get to Professor Restifo. The first is um, Dean Shlomi Dinar, who is currently the Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs. Um, and before I introduce a little bit about him. I think I want to also acknowledge um, and we can take a, a moment of silence um, for the passing of the previous dean um, who passed uh, earlier this year. I think you, you all know um, Dean John Stack. Uh, he died of um, a very uh, uh, difficult sort of disease, unfortunately. Um, but he really was a great friend of the Jain community, and he really helped to establish 
um, this partnership. Um, and he was one of the few people that were open to working with faith communities. So really before um, Dean Stack, people were like, okay, why, why do we need religion? What's the importance of religion um, in sort of the academic world? You know, we just need to focus on science. And, and really it was Dean Stack who said, no, you know, religion, humanities, these ideas are critical for the well-being of our, of our society. And we really need to learn from uh, societies and cultures outside of our own uh, here in the West. And so his, uh, he pushed through with the president um, uh, at that time, Rosenberg, to establish uh, the, the program for Jane Studies while it was the College of Arts and Sciences, and then establishing SIPA. And uh, now uh, uh, Dean Shlomi Dinar, who has a doctorate from Columbia, um, and helped to then not just envision and actually materialize the School of International Public Affairs, but also got the school um, approval into APSIA, which is sort of a global um, uh, uh, gathering of schools from around the world, the top universities. Um, so we're part of this elite uh, establishment of universities, and we hope that FIU and the program for Jane Studies becomes something that is globally recognized, right? And so that's kind of what we're trying to do here with the Institute for Advanced Jane Studies with Professor Restifo's leadership, really thinking how do we translate Jainism, not just as values that can help to heal the world, but also how do we translate those values for young Janes in the United States and for Americans uh, generally as well. So we have so many different levels at which we're working and we're very honored that um, Professor uh, Slomi Dinar, who is also the Dean of the college, also fulfills and wants to further that vision and is helping us to be able to move that forward. So with that, I will welcome uh, Dean Dinar. Thank you. Wow, Iqbal, thank you so much for those uh, kind words. And, and thank you so much also for speaking about Dean, our founding Dean, uh, John F. Stack Jr. Uh, Iqbal, I can't say it better than you. Uh, John was not only understood what a school of international public affairs was all about, the importance, and, and you've said it, uh, so forgive me if I'm repeating what you said, understanding that to take the social sciences and the humanities, uh, having a department of religious studies, and also looking at this through the lens of Jainism, I'm so, so glad that you, uh, you mentioned John because he was very much central to the success of the Jain Studies program. And it's interesting that you mentioned the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. In fact, I had a conversation just before the event started about APSIA and talking about other schools and where Jainism, where, where there may be other Jain centers and perhaps how we at FIU could promote Jainism through, through the organization. So, wow. That's kind of uh, serendipitous that we had that conversation. Uh, it is an honor uh, for me uh, to be with you for our annual Nirvana Lecture of the Jane Studies Program at FRU. Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge our good friends and longtime collabor collaborators from the Jane Education Research Foundation, without whom this program and this event would not be possible. I want to thank and acknowledge founding members of JERF, Nirmal Baid and Sapan Bafna for their steadfast encouragement and support over the years of the Jain Studies program at FIU. And I also want to thank Dr. Deepak Jain, the former chairman of JERF, who led the way to the creation of the program and the establishment of our Bhagwan Mahavir professorship in Jain Studies. I'm very grateful for his commitment to assist us in expanding the Jain Studies program in new and exciting ways. It is my privilege to welcome our recently appointed Bhagwan Mahavir Professor in Jain Studies, Dr. Alexandra Sasha Restrifo, who previously taught at Yale and Oxford Universities. Welcome, Dr. Restrifo. <laughs> and of course, thank you to all the members of the Jain community from throughout South Florida who have joined us here this evening. We are always so pleased to have you with us for these events where we share a meal and engage in dialogue about Jainism, one of the world's oldest religions whose principles have so much relevance to many of the challenges we face as one human family. It is truly an exciting time for Jain studies and for the Green School. As many of you know, JERF recently joined us here at FIU to launch a national multi-million dollar campaign to fund the creation 
of an institute for advanced Jane studies to be housed in the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. The institute will be organized as a think tank to bring Jane studies scholars together and to connect them to policymakers, social activists, and industry leaders with the goal of applying Jane principles to real world challenges. As always, we are so grateful to our partners at JERF for leading the way and going beyond traditional religious education to demonstrate how Jane tradition can help address global challenges from the COVID-19 pandemic and global conflict to climate change and poverty. It is a fascinating and enriching area of study for our students and one that is in perfect alignment with the Green School mission. We thank you for entrusting FIU and the Green School with this important work and we look forward to many more years of this successful partnership. Thank you, and please enjoy your evening. Last but not least, um, my mentor and the chair of the Department of Religious Studies, Professor Eric Larson. Um, he completed his doctorate uh, at NYU uh, in uh, New York and has been the chair of the department uh, for at least the last decade uh, that I've been here. And he's really guided uh, our department through some very tumultuous times, uh, but has really provided the leadership uh, that we've needed to be able to not just expand the Jane Studies program, but with that, we've also established um, a Muslim World Studies program. We're now expanding into Tamil language and Tamil culture, so looking at Hindu Tamil language and culture as well as Jain uh, and, and other sort of uh, traditions sort of within Tamil culture as well. Um, so really kind of expanding and thinking through what are all of the ways that different communities that are representing the United States can teach us about um, their own heritage and sort of how we can connect that to making our society better. So with that, I want to welcome Professor Eric Larson to say a few words to the, to the community. Thank you everyone and welcome. We're so happy to have each and every one of you here tonight. And it's so wonderful to, to restart this lecture series um, to renew the program and uh, to continue to do all the good things that, that we've been doing. Um, I learned something recently, and I, I think probably many of you know this, but maybe not everybody in, in the room knows this, that FIU has the oldest chair of Jane Studies in the nation, and we're very proud of that. But what I learned recently, um, back in 1893, a long, long time ago, there was a parliament of world religions that was held in Chicago. Um, it was really a new beginning and something very different in the United States and maybe throughout the world. But the idea was to gather people of all different religious faiths. There were um, Jews, Christians, Muslims, but also Hindus and Buddhists. And what I learned that I didn't know before was that there were also Jain scholars who were present at that august event. Um, the speaker in Hinduism, really electrified people when um, he started his address and say, I bring you greetings from India, brothers and sisters. And people broke out into applause. Imagine in 1893, the idea that, you know, the, the human race was one great um, brotherhood, right? And sisterhood of people from all different um, beliefs and backgrounds, but that we all held spiritual values in common. But the speaker who made the greatest impact was actually one of the Jain speakers. And people were just so impressed by the wisdom and the grace and the understanding and the values um, that he shared with them at that conference. Here, we have been very proud of the Jain Studies program and all the, the successes that we've had. And we're especially proud right now. Um, I love seeing my, my junior professors come along. So Professor Akhtar has become the, the academic director of Jain Studies. And of course, we thank everybody in the, the Green School, the Dean's Office for helping us so much. Uh, Dean Dinar, we really appreciate your support. And Pedro Bota, um, I'll mention you especially. So, and David Skip, um, thank you so much for all the work that you have done. But it's really a great privilege and an honor to see a young scholar with the academic promise and the brightness of Professor Restifo. We're just so, so happy that she's here 
and we look forward to many great years of cooperation and taking Jane studies even to a greater level. So thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the lecture tonight. All right, now we're here for the one of the main events for tonight. Um, we're very honored to have Professor um, Alexandra Sasha Restifo, who is now the Bhagwan Mahavir Professor for Jain Studies at Florida International University. Um, she completed her doctorate at Yale, um, her, um, first master's, a uh, second master's at SOAS. Um, she has a, a BA from Indology at St. Peter, Petersburg University and also has an MA from Hyderabad Central University. For those of you who are Hindi speakers or Urdu speakers, um, Professor Restifo is a native, like she speaks Hindi natively. So if you wanna talk to her in Hindi, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, unbelievable. I've, I've, I've rarely seen that. Um, so her Hindi is impeccable. Um, she researches emotion and its role in ritual and social culture in South Asian religions, um, of course, focusing on Jainism. Her current book project examines the ways in which emotion participates in Jain metaphysical theories, ritual practice, devotional expression, and community formation. Uh, through an exploration of emotional concepts and uh, perceptions of emotional experience and medieval Prakrit and Sanskrit sources, Professor Estifo offers a new understanding of the processes that underline change and continuity in Jainism. More broadly, she's interested in medieval and early modern Jain literary culture in the context of religious and political change. Her forthcoming study uh, is entitled Genre as a Polemical Device, an Alternative Biography of um, Manarsidarsa, um, Addressing a Polemical Response to a New uh, Spiritual Movement in Jainism that Appeared as a Threat to the Existing Tradition and Continuity of Knowledge. So with that, I am honored and privileged to welcome Professor Sasha Restifo to the podium. <laughs> Uh, thank you for my, thank you so much for the introduction, Iqbal. It was too generous, um, but uh, I'm very I'm delighted to join the Department of Religious Studies and uh, Florida International University more generally. Um, and thank you so much for making this event uh, possible, for organizing it uh, to Anu and Iqbal and Padre and Janet and many many others. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, without uh, further ado, I'm going to start because I know people are probably getting hungry already. So, um, Jain literature is chock full of stories about, about tricksters, cheats, and rogues. They deceive, lie to, and mislead others. At the same time, they often possess courage and pluck. They're audacious and shrewd. Indeed, they're not necessarily negative characters in Jain stories. It is their weaknesses, such as lust or greed, that get the best of them and, the, and make them act in, controver in controversial ways. Ravana, in the Jain telling of the Rama story, is a famous example. He is a pious and intelligent Jain devotee, but falling prey to lust, he cannot stop himself from contriving tricks to abduct Sita. Ravana and many other characters use deception or Maya to get what they want. If the lack um, to get they want right, if the lack of resilience is one cause for their inclination to cheat and lie, false perception and wrong judgment is another. Wrong cognition leads to self-deception and thus to the deception of others. Giant texts tell us that we often don't know who we really are, who we are in reality. And as a result of this, we tend to fool others. After all, deception or maya is the very fabric of this world of samsara, and living beings partake in deception in one way or another. They're ignorant about, about their pure selves, deluded into identifying with karmic matter, including emotional states, and attached to what is not valuable or true, such as family relations. This paper explores the interconnected nature of deception and false judgment through Jain literature. I will show that Jains recognized people's predilection to deceive and be deceived by making quick judgments and drawing false conclusions. I will begin by showing that already in the Isibhasiam, sayings of the seers, 
one of the earliest Shvetambara texts, we find both an acknowledgement that humans are rarely true to themselves, wearing masks and guises, and that humans tend to make wrong assumptions about others based on external, insignificant attributes. The text invites its readers and listeners to practice hermeneutical tools and discrimination to see the truth beneath all the guises and masks. Next, next, I will turn to the ways in which Ramachandra, a medieval Jain monk and poet and a disciple of the famous Hemachandra, understands and discusses the nature of deception and false perception in his dramas, particularly the one titled Malika and Makaranda. Ramachandra is, a, is pragmatic and realistic in his appraisal of the part that deception plays in this world. He recognizes that it is ubiquitous and often necessary but points to the many adverse effects it produces. He identifies a number of reasons that cause self-deception and wrong judgment, such as generalizations, focusing on others' flaws, making hasty conclusions based on external properties, and concentrating on what is insignificant and inessential. I suggest that by highlighting these human inclinations, Ramachandra invites his audiences to observe the limitations of the ways they used to perceive the world and reconsider their means of perception. In the final part of my presentation, I will zoom in on a specific case of a mother-daughter relationship in Malika and Makaranda. From the first sight, a mother, Chandra Lekha, appears as violent, abusive, and dangerous towards her daughter Malika, who herself behaves rudely, rudely and impetuously. But as we keep on reading and probing, we discover a more, a more complex picture, one in which the mother fights and sacrifices her happiness for her vision of her daughter's happiness, and the daughter is willing to die, lie, and deceive for her own version of happiness. Ramachandra's example of this relationship, rooted in mutual misunderstanding, reveals what comes out of people's predilection to surface readings, namely mental and physical pain. The Isi Bahasiyam, a text that Nalini Balbir calls, and I quote, a concentration of metaphors applied in the realm of ethical discourse, end quote, sets the scene by pronouncing the truth about humanity. Know that people are weak by nature, and they appear in different guises. Similarly, a person assumes a role according to the dictates of karma, having wealth and good looks and all that, just like an actor on stage. The verse compares people to actors on stage who put on different roles or wear different costumes to appear what they are not. The external characteristics of material and physical nature shouldn't be mistakenly identified with what constitutes the true essence of a person. The external is materialized and brought into contact with the self by virtue of karma, as we all know. Karmic matter defines the nature and the amount of good fortune in the present life. It is no truer than the costume an actor puts on and removes at the end of, of a performance. The unity of the self and karmic matter is only a distorted perception, an epistemic error, analogous to a mistaken identification of the actor with his role um, or mask. One should work hard to be able to see the truth beneath masking and other types of guising. And this is of particular significance, the text tells us, in being able to distinguish a true monk from a false monk, although it applies equally to everyone we encounter. One should realize the true nature of people, of phony mendicants, beneath all the guises in relation to substance, space, time, and mental dispositions. Just as a sharp sword remains in its sheath and a fire is hidden under the ashes, so the understated man is hidden under the guise of a monk. Guising is the, is, is a, is the prerequisite of being in this world. The state of appearing through the lens of the material is at the core of human identity. The plural genitive compound linga jivanam can be also understood as a technical term denoting lax unrestrained monks who possess the necessary outward mendicant signs, the pulled out hair, a white robe, a water pot, a woolen broom, while harboring lust and anger inside. 
The author makes it clear that assuming material guises is what the non-liberated souls do. The four elements, substance, space, time, and mental disposition, are the four nikshepas, or uh, the, translated by John Cord as, and others as giant hermeneutical tools or contextualizing frames in conformity with which one should analyze every phenomenon. So the verse enjoins us to employ, every to, to employ every tool in order to discern the truth about oneself and others beneath all sorts of guises, monastic or otherwise. Turning to Ramachandra and the world of drama, we discover a reality that is complex and therefore controversial. Through his characters, Ramachandra repeatedly admits that some forms of deception are unavoidable for people in this world. Wise people always consider deception despicable, but without it, difficult things cannot be achieved. One who rejects, rejects deceit must belong to the other world. Those who stay in this world definitely engage in deceit. One who is devoid of deception, compassionate, truthful, and humble often appears weak-minded to people. One needs to be shrewd, audacious, and daring to attain success or accomplish important things in this world. This is particularly relevant for a king or a merchant, the common protagonists in Ramachandra's dramas. To achieve their goals, they often need to cause a false perception in others by putting on a show or creating illusions. And people love shows, and deceive, uh, people love shows that deceive them so much so that they enjoy watching dramas, even if, in, even if the dramatic plots upset, frighten, or disgust them. In Mirror of Drama, the Natya Dharpana, Ramachandra and his co-author Guna Chandra explain that aesthetic pleasure ensues from precisely the realization of being deceived. That they, the four unpleasurable aesthetic emotions, elicit the feeling of wonder or chamatkara is what happens after the savoring of aesthetic emotions has ended and is the result of the genius of the poet of the skill of the actor in showing things as they really are. Indeed, those who, hate, who, who take pride and courage are astounded by the deft attack of a hero, even if it leads to someone's decapitation. Wise people, having been deceived by the feeling of wonder produced by the talent of a poet or an actor, which causes the whole body to be suffused with pleasure, experience the state of the highest bliss, even in unpleasurable aesthetic emotions, such as pitiful, etc. So the audience comes to enjoy drama or poetry as a result of being in a state of double deception. Firstly, by presenting things realistically, brilliant acting or excellent poetry leads the audience members to forget that drama portrays a fictional world and identify actors with the characters they portray. Further, the viewers themselves become so absorbed in the dramatic action that they identify with the character's states and experience pleasant and unpleasant emotions along with them. After the savoring of the aesthetic emotion ends, they realize that they have been beguiled by the genius of actors and poets and attain the state of wonder or chamatkara. Secondly, while captivated by this pleasurable sensation of chamatkara, the viewers feel the highest joy and misconstrue its cause by locating them, by locating it in the emotions themselves. In this way, the audience is first deluded by poetry and acting that present the fictional world with such realism, and then they are led to misidentify the source of their intense pleasure. Pleasure here is inseparable from false perception and the state of being deceived. Now, the question of false, false perception and erroneous judgment is at the center of Ramachandra's Malika and Makaranda. Ramachandra exposes human inclinations to focus on the external, to generalize and concentrate on others' flaws, all unhelpful in forming a truthful picture of reality. He begins his play by debunking the criticism leveled at giant monks for composing dramatic literature for entertainment and pleasure. He argues that others should not judge mendicants by external attributes. The actor expresses doubt about the ability of Ramachandra, as a giant monk, to compose a play filled with the erotic, comic, or heroic emotion. 
since everyone knows that mendicants are only capable of preaching sermons on the giant dharma that elicit the peaceful emotion. Actor, disdainfully, sir, the mendicants are learned only in evoking the aesthetic emotion of peacefulness. Observing restraint in speech, they only use their eloquence for teaching giant, the giant dharma. They're completely incapable of composing dramas that exhibit the erotic, comic, and heroic aesthetic emotions. The director, however, points out that it is a foolish thought. Director, or what a friend, now you are saying things which betray, which betray that you don't have the cleverness of even a villager. Everyone in the world knows that peacefulness is the true nature of great monks. But although gods are born in heaven, they travel in other worlds too. So the director's response suggests that external actions do not impact the true nature of gods who belong to heaven. In the same way, monks' true nature is indeed equanimity and peacefulness, but that doesn't prevent them from writing beautiful poetry or engaging in dramas filled with different aesthetic emotions. The actor's mistake is that he thinks external activity reflects the internal processes in what is real and true. The actor is guilty of surface understanding and pronounces a false judgment. Throughout the play, Ramachandra teaches his audiences to discriminate between a true cause such as rain for the growth of trees and what only appears to be a cause such as thunder for the same. Between the apparent, such as the low social status of Krishna as a shepherd and the internal, such as his true abilities. Ramachandra shows that such external attributes as social status or appearance are misleading and don't reflect the truth about an individual, while true things are often invisible or less prominent. For instance, he juxtaposes ritual to the inward recitation of the Namaskara mantra, good looks to courage, social status to great potential, and action to intention, Abhipraya. The word bahya, external, is repeatedly juxtaposed with the words paramartha, real, or vastava, actual. Ramachandra invites us to learn to see beyond the flaws and beyond the seemingly apparently and obvious. Things often end up being not the way they appear. One should be patient and probing. As the protagonist Makaranda warns us, it is not helpful to draw generalizations or expect the same outcome in similar situations. He says, it is not with all lovers that women have bad luck. Trees hate the frost, but barley and corn love it. The same thing gets different reactions from others. The frost is not generally good or bad, but it is good for barley and bad for trees. Reality is complex. This is a call for attention to the specific context, both in making things known and in knowing them. As we know from giant epistemology, knowledge is contextual. One needs to understand the full, the full picture before drawing conclusions. I will now briefly summarize the plot of Malika and Makaranda. So Makaranda is a son of a merchant and has spent his entire life gambling away his father's capital. He has never earned anything on his own and depends on others even for food. In, addic in addition to his addiction to gambling, he has also been addicted to sex with courtesans from the time of his youth. We know that there are two, that these are two of the seven vices or addictions, saptavyasana, which must be avoided by a lay person who wants to lead a good life. Well, we are told that Makaranda led the shameful, miserable life of a beggar and eventually couldn't stay in his community any longer. So he left for a place called Panchashaila Island. There, as he was hiding from debt collectors, he met Malika, who was about to hang herself on a tree. It turns out that she was in great fear of being abducted by an evil deity. We'll later find out that this deity was Malika's own Vidyadhari birth mother. Now, Vidyadhara, as Christy Wiley recently argued, is, uh, um, is, a, is, a, is human, are humans who possess special superhuman powers, such as the ability to fly. Now, Makaranda promises, his, uh, Makaranda promises Malika's adoptive parents that he will save Malika, but doesn't keep his promise. He really is good for nothing, and Malika is taken away. We then find her on Jewel Peak in the form of a male ascetic, both terrified by and angry at her mother. Makaranda is later brought to that mountain by a bird, recognizes Malika, and eventually marries her by means of lies, deception, and tricks. 
So in giant tales, characters frequently start off as thieves and miscreants. But when their bad karmas wear off, they return to the right path, often through giant teachings. Karma from past births defines the character, such characteristics as appearance and social status, but one should not be misled by these external qualities. The truth about an individual cannot be seen with ordinary eyes. Rather, it consists of inner processes, as Ramachandra keeps telling us. As Makaranda agrees to help Malika and learns the details of her misfortune, that a deity will come to abduct her and murder her protector, he realizes that someone like him will not be able to stop the deity. But it is too late to break the promise, and he reassures Brahmadatta Malika's father that he possesses magic powers. Makaranda's lies don't, do not surprise Brahmadatta. He thought that Makaranda was special the moment he saw how handsome he was. But Makaranda realizes that a put on show will be of no help in this serious matter. This can be accomplished only with great courage, no need for any external show. But that too demands its place. Rainwater causes trees to grow, not the sound of thunder, but in the month of Magha, the clouds thunder anyway, much to the consternation of everyone. The external is seen, uh, what, uh, is seen as what is false and leads to, to people to make and leads people to make wrong judgments, even if it is an inevitable accompaniment of what is real. Makaranda acknowledges that he needs to put up a show for others. And even though he, quote unquote, can, can be satisfied only with things that are real, such as the internal recitation of the Namaskara mantra, a mantra with which to worship the five types of the giant great souls, as everyone knows. The father of Malika falsely assumed that Makaranda had special powers or was able to defeat the deity solely based on Makaranda's lovely appearance. But Makaranda admits the truth about himself and knows that things that are prominent and loud, like thunder, are often not the causes or agents of a good outcome. Rather, what is less noticeable and makes a considerably less powerful impression ultimately accomplishes the goal. Now, later in the play, Magad Yikam Malik has made, reiterates this important message when she relates to Makaranda Malika's words that advise him to become small in order to, in order to save himself from the Vidyadhara Chitrangana, who is also in love with Malika. Indeed, you are my husband. You should protect yourself from Chitrangana by becoming small or insignificant. A man potent meant he who makes himself small does something great in the end. Having reduced himself to the lowly state of a cowherd, Hari killed Kamsa. Hari is, the, is another name for Krishna. The form of the coward does not exhaust or define the real nature of Krishna, his might or intelligence. And the same sentiment is repeated over and over again by Makaran, for instance, when Makaranda convinces a talking parrot that he shouldn't be judged by his apparent insignificance. He says, quote unquote, an incredibly difficult thing cannot be accomplished by great people. But can, be become, but can be attained by a small person. Now here I'd like to briefly pause uh, and to comment on the picture that all of you probably saw on the flyer for this event. And um, here it is. It is um, the ceiling from the Ranakpur temple in Rajasthan. And it is a scene where Krishna, in the middle, actually, have this, where it is the scene where Krishna, in the middle, encounters and subdues the Kaliya serpent in the Yamuna River. That is the Kaliya serpent. And Krishna is holding a lot of stock in his hand, which he tied to the nose of the serpent. And he pulled the serpent out of the river uh, by using the lotus stock. In the other hand, Krishna is holding a discus with, as though he wants to cut the coils of the serpent. You can see that the tail of the serpent develops in uh, entangled coils and creates this beautiful ornament. And the figures and the wives of the wives of the serpent Kaliya are depicted on the sides with folded hands, just like the Kaliya is with, hold, fold, with folded hands, as though they are asking for forgiveness and to spare the to spare Kaliya's life. Uh, and indeed, Krishna spares uh, the serpent's life. 
So from and at that time, in fact, Krishna is just a boy. From the first sight, Krishna is you know just a boy and 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 cannot accomplish too much but in reality he's very powerful now the motive and and that and that, and that kind of relief is very popular in giant temples it's also in the uh on the ceiling of the vimalavasa here on mount tabu for instance and i think also on shatrunja so the motive that social standing doesn't reflect inner power is a particularly prominent in giant literature and it often surfaces in discussions about the hierarchical relationship between the merchant and kshatriya classes just as it does in this play makaran discourages juxtaposed with that of Vidyadhara Chitrangala. Makaranda repeats a verse that also appears in another drama by Ramachandra, the Kaumudi and Mitrananda, and that valorizes one's, one's own inner strength over riches uh, brought about by favorable fate. Now, the dialogue between Makaranda, his rival Chitrangada, and Chitrangada's companion Kapindula is comical. And I hope you enjoy that. Who are you? with anger a oh, blabbering merchant you're asking me i'm chitrangada the prince of vidyadharas makaranda sarcastically then i'm makaranda a supreme prince of vidyadharas kapinjala a oh, lowly merchant you're equating yourself with the prince an ornament of the kshatriya dynasty whose broad shoulders indicate his heroism makaranda wicked dog you have no idea what things are of what things are in reality heroism has nothing to do with varna it resides only in one's true courage and true courage may be found in a merchant and may not always be found in a kshatriya that courage is not confined to kshatriyas is indeed a fundamental matter for jains who largely come from the merchant class Ramachandra relegates social markets to external attributes which are either false or empty of substance and therefore misleading the word var varna can be translated as social class, but it can also be used as it was in the Isibhasi I am cited earlier to mean disguise, costume, or makeup. In order to save Malika from abduction, Makaranda devises a complex tantric ritual that requires extraordinary items, such as the milk of a young tigress or bright yellow pigment from the horns of deer that live on the Vindhya mountains. As Makaranda is constructing the mandala, however, however, he admits that all of these ritual activities are meant to distract others, but he would need something real to protect himself. Others can be, enter can be entertained by a fake show, but I can only be satisfied by things that are real. The episode appears to ridicule rituals, and particularly sophisticated tantric rituals, in their incapacity to produce real effects and save Makaranda from the deity. In their phoniness, they only work to show to, they only work as a show to deceive the outside world. Externality and the unreality converge again in the protagonist's words. In contrast to the, to the ritual, for his own protection, Makaranda chooses to recall the Namaskara mantra. The mental concentration on the mantra may not be seen by others, but it has an actual result. Finally, Ramachandra makes intention the true measure of an action. What is meaningful cannot be easily perceived. Even a wrongdoing, if it, if it is done without a bad intention, <clears throat> is not considered blameworthy. The religious teacher who scolds and smacks his students is held up for praise. Intention may not be visible to others, but it is what matters, not external actions. Ramachandra in this play uses the contrast between appearances, externals, and internal reality to make a number of points. He insists on a giant monk's freedom to be a full-fledged poet, for the monk's internal reality, which with all, of that, with all that implies, remains unchanged, as he writes dramas about love and other worldly matters. He also challenges the standard hierarchical boundaries between Vaishyas and Kshatriyas and questions the efficiency of rituals by focusing on something internal, intention. I will now turn to the final part of my presentation and consider the relationship of the two main female characters in the play, Malika and her birth mother, Chandralekha. From the first sight, it is tempting to judge Chandralekha as transgressive, abusive, and violent. She commits adultery, or is Malika to be whipped drags her by her hair and trans transforms her into a man and verbally abuses her. 
but as the play evolves, and we hear new details about Chandra Lekha's past experiences from Chandra Lekha herself, we learn to understand and empath empathize with her a bit more. The problem is, as Chandra Lekha laments, that people, te people tend to overlook a thousand virtues if there is just one flaw. We have seen that Makaranda suffers from the addictions to gambling and sex and leads the life of a beggar who is constantly on the run from people to whom he owes money. The story of Makaranda is immediately preceded by the story of Chandralekha in the play. Her story, related to Makaranda by Malika, um, is no less controversial than Makaranda's. And just as is Makaranda's life, so too is Chandralekha's characterized by the word Vyasana, that is addiction or vice. Chandralekha was the main queen of the Vidyadhraki in Vainatea. One day she crossed the tower Shikara, the, the tower Shikara of the Siddhaitana temple, and as a result of which she forgot the secret knowledge of Vidya, of flying, and fell on Jewel Peak. She was unable to return to her family and, and missed the ability to fly. So she renounces the objects of pleasure for six months and, uh, and, uh, and performed penance in order to get the vidya of the, the, the knowledge of flying back. As she completed her vow and was happy about regaining the, the ability to fly, she had sex with a Kirata youth, her mind blinded by Kamadeva. With her bad karma ripen, when her bad car karma ripened, she became pregnant, gave birth to a child, tied a tiny valuable amulet to her, and left her in the home of Brahmadatta and his wife, who became Malika's step-parents on Panchashaila Island. When Malika attained puberty, Chandralekha abducted her and brought to Jewel Peak, where she repeatedly urged her to marry a Vidyadhara prince. But Malika is in love with, with Makaranda and has no desire to marry the Vidyadhara. In response to Malika's protest, Chandralekha transforms Malika into a man, drags her by her hair, and orders her to be whipped. We know of examples of mean mothers from Sanskrit literature. For instance, as Christy Wiley pointed out to me in a recent conversation, in Valmiki's Ramayana, Ravana's mother, Kaikasi, becomes jealous of Ravana's half-brother, Kubera, and tries to get Ravana to act against him. Oh, that was, sorry. My son, look at your brother, who is haloed with blazing energy. And then, even though your status as his brother makes you his equal, just look at your own condition. Kaikasi humiliates Ravana and tells him to exert himself to outdo Kubera. As Bob and Sally Goldman stress, and I quote, Ravana's greed and his jealousy of Kubera are a direct result of his mother's unhappiness, end quote. It is fitting to compare Chandralekha to Rakshasa because your actions are often violent. In addition to tormenting Malika, Chandralekha attempts to kill Makaranda by throwing a large rock on his head, Chandralekha's unrestrained sexuality further invites the comparison with the Rakshasa lineage. Another example of an unkind mother appears in the Trishashti Shalaka Purusha Charita. In the story of the householder Nagila and his wife Nagashri, who, as the text says, were, mis were miserable and very unfortunate on account of having six daughters. When Nagashri gave birth to yet another daughter, Nagila left. In despair, Nagashri didn't even, didn't even give the baby a name, and people called her Nirnamika, a girl without a name. One day during a festival, Nirnamika saw sweetmeats and asked her mother for some. As Helen Johnson translates, grinding her teeth, her mother told her, you ask for sweetmeats? That is fitting. Did your father eat sweetmeats? If you want to eat sweetmeats, take a rope, go to Mount Ambaratilaka for a load of wood, ugliness. Burned by that speech, as if by a done fire, crying, she took a rope and went to the mountains. Nagashri is evidently exhausted by raising daughters alone without her husband. But of course, her response to Nirnamika is unkind. Rav, neither Ravana nor Nirnamika contradict their mothers and both follow their orders 
even though they're deeply hurt. Contrary to this example, Malika, in response to her mother, fights back. She makes fun of Chandralekha, accuses her of bad conduct, and declares outright that she doesn't recognize her as her mother, unusually so. But Malika is also scared of Chandralekha and her violent intentions. She trembles thinking of what Chandralekha can do and repeats, quote unquote, alas, my mother is cruel to me. She laments that, quote unquote, hatred in a mother is one of the main misfortunes and calls her mother, quote unquote, the ocean of vice. Here's an example of a conversation between Malika and Chandralekha. Malika, transformed into a young ascetic by Chandralekha. Angrily, mother, why are you trying to kill this great innocent man? Kill me, your wicked child, who is the cause of your mental pain. Chandralekha, a wicked blabber troubled by youth. If your desire is for death, I will fulfill it. Pulling Malika is young ascetic by the hair. Devalaka, take this wicked slave girl. At the beginning of the next act, we find Magad, Yika Malika's maid, crying and telling Makaranda that Malika is in danger. What can I, wretched woman, say? Right now, Malika's life is in danger. After she was taken from her bower and brought to the house of Chandralekha, she was whipped for, rem for remembering you. The theme of death reappears again in a conversation between Malika and Magadhika. The conversation is interrupted by Chandralekha, who enters accompanied by her servant, Tamarasa. I'm going to do what my mother Chandra like her desires from off stage. Daughter, what is it I desire? Magadhika, looking, is this Queen Chandra like her? Entering, supported by Tamarasa's hand. Chandra like her. Daughter, what is it I desire? Malika, my death. The only mother's order that Malika is willing to follow is that of death. In response to these harsh words, for the first time, we get to hear Chandra like her take on the situation with sorrow to Tamarasa. Clouds completely remove heat, fill hundreds of rivers, including the Ganges, and nourish plants. And all that goes to waste because of one thing, that it doesn't quench the thirst of the wretched Chataka birds. Alas, people overlook a flood of virtues and focus on a single flaw. I've suffered the distress of childbearing and childbirth, to protect her, I did the unthinkable. I left her in the home of the noble Brahmandatta. I've been trying to arrange your marriage with the Vidyadhara prince who possesses a kingdom and fortune. And Malika, this daughter of mine, is bringing all of that to waste because of the separation from that lowly merchant. Chandralaka endured the pain and trouble of childbearing and giving birth had to find a way to protect her baby, and now is trying to arrange a good marriage for her. Malika, however, appreciates none of this and insists on doing what Chandralekha perceives as nothing but youthful foolishness. Chandralekha compares herself to the cloud that, accomplish, that accomplishes many things, but all people speak about is how it can never fully quench the Chataka bird's thirst. Similarly, Chandralekha has gone through so much trouble to arrange a good life for her daughter, but all everyone sees and knows is her imperfect conduct. Chandralekha's servants warn her that if something happens to Malika, people will reproach her. But Chandralekha is no longer scared of scandal. She says, and I quote, I've already been expelled by the people of my own community for my three way of life. What can be a greater scandal than that?" End quote. From, this scene, from these scenes, we see that Chandralekha does not have evil intentions whatsoever, and her decisions have been, dedicate, have been dedicated to ensuring that Malika is safe and well. We now know that she did not abandon Malika, but handed her to Brahmadatta and his wife for her own protection. This reminds us of famous characters from the Mahabharata and Ramayana, Kunti had to give up Karna to protect him, him, him and herself, and Devaki and Vasudeva saved their son Krishna by handing him over to Yashoda and Nanda. The initial image of Chandralekha as a powerful, scary, and violent demoness has dissipated. We now see a single loving mother scared for her daughter and working hard to arrange her life. 
Ignorant of all this, Malika speaks to her mother in the same way that Makaranda speaks to his rival in the play, the Vidyadhara prince Chitrangada, which is baffling. Malika is intransigent, disrespectful, sarcastic, and dismissive. One would ask, how is it even possible for a daughter to be so rude with a parent in, Sanskrit, in a Sanskrit text? And the answer to that we find in the last conversation between Malika and Chandralekha. Dora, why do you despise me, your own mother? Accept me, do your duty so that I can make suitable arrangements. Malika, with anger, I've accepted you as my enemy. I'm doing my duty, which is, my, which is death. Make arrangements for my death. Chandralekha, with reproach, Oh, wicked, hating me for no reason, disrespectful, ingrate. Because I carried you in my womb, I was expelled from the home of my parents and in-laws. And now I'm suffering, living like an ascetic on Jewel Peak, where demons roam. On top of that, you're tormenting me with your crooked words. Malika, mother, it's not me who is the cause of your suffering. It is your bad conduct. Chandralekha to Tamarasa. Do you see how my daughter is twisting the knife? Magadika, with anger, to Malika. Princess, you are mean. Do you think it's appropriate to repeat, a roof, to repeat rumors about your mother? Malika treats Chandralekha without the affection or respect that parents normally receive from their children in Sanskrit literature. Her sarcasm expressed by her use of indirect speech Reminds of the ways enemies, such as Rama and Ravana, or Makaranda and Chitrangana, speak to one another. From this conversation, we understand that the reason for that is that Chandralekha's conduct was unrestrained by societal rules. She committed adultery. What's striking, though, is that we have seen that Chandralekha's life story is juxtaposed with Makaranda's life story. Both of them made mistakes and broke the norms of propriety, but Makaranda is forgiven and redeemed. He is said to feel remorse and desire to perform atonement, prayashchita. He focused on the internal and what is true. He is compassionate. His, his heart is the mirror of another's suffering and courageous. He has sattva. If it is not unusual in medieval literature to portray a virtuous person as a male beggar addicted to gambling and sex, it appears less common to depict a mother as abusive, violent, and adulterous, and a daughter as rude and disrespectful to her mother. Unlike Makaranda's case, no efforts or good deeds on the part of Chandralekha seem to be able to compensate for her, for her single mistake of adultery in the past. She doesn't receive redemption or kindness from her own daughter, who sees her as the enemy. Nevertheless, it is important that we hear her voice, her side of the story, and her criticism of society that is interested only in others' flaws and turns a blind eye to others' virtues. Emerging as a frightening force at the beginning of the play, Chandralekha gradually transforms into nearly a victim who cannot earn her daughter's respect and is unsuccessful in trying to assert her will. In conclusion, I want to suggest that the call to distrust generalizations to combat the inclination to focus on flaws and to question what you, what you immediately see, reflect some of the giant, I'm almost done, some of the giant philosophical and epistemological considerations. In addition to the development of a nuanced methodology often called the multiplexity of reality, unlike other Indian philosophical systems, in Jainism, sensory perception is, is considered as an indirect type of cognition, paroksha. What you see with your eyes or hear with your ears is not a direct type of cognition. It is mediated by the visual or olfactory organ and therefore, cannot be, therefore can be easily inaccurate. Perspectivism is also important to the ways giants suggest seeing the world. And it helps resolve the perennial contradictions within the traditions. We have seen that Ramachandra admits the inevitability of engaging in some form of self-deception and deception of others for non-liberated souls. At the same time, throughout his plays, and particularly Malika and Makaranda, he shows the difference between what is true and what only appears to be true. Malika as herself, or transformed into a man, is the same person. The gendered characteristics have no bearing on her identity. Chandralekha's identity as a mother, 
does not change based on the fact that she conceived her daughter in an adulterous relationship. Makaranda's good heart was not affected by his addictions to gambling and sex. People tend to focus on what is most scandalous and prominent, but the truth lies often lies on the periphery, in the margins, in the small and insignificant, what is easily overlooked and missed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Restifo. That was a wonderful lecture. Um, and I think it was wonderful the way that you were able to weave the narrative. The story, I think, is, is so helpful for us and, and particularly for you translating and, and work. That was excellent. We really enjoyed it. Um, so I think we're going to move on to the second part of our program uh, this evening. So there are a couple things that we're going to be doing. One is just to know your table. This is table one, table two, table three, table four, five, six, seven. We're going to go in order. Um, Ramnikji is going to come and she's going to start the musical performance. And what we'll do is we'll have table one go out, bring, uh, get their food, and then come in. And then table two will leave and come back. Um, and while we're doing that, um, as Ramnikji is uh, setting up, uh, maybe Sonal Ben can come and just say a few words about Jerf um, to us uh, before we start. All right. Please welcome. Respected, invited dignitaries, Dean, I forgot again name, <laughs> Slomi Dinar, Professor Larson, Professor Sasha, Dr. Chetan, um, Samni Chetan Pragyaji, Dr. Him Pragyaji, and of course, Dr. Akhtar. And welcome Jain community friends, and of course, our musicians and FIU house team. On behalf of JERF, we would like to say thank you to come over here and attend a lecture. What a wonderful lecture by Professor Shasa. What a wonderful topic. It's false appraisal and quick judgment. In other words, do not judge the book by the cover. Am I correct? So thank you for your very brief and nice explanation. We understand with the story. And we also have, uh, I think I would not take more time because everybody's hungry, am I correct? So I would, as uh, Professor Akhtar will announce the table so we can go and enjoy the dinner. Thank you for coming. Of course, and we have a one index card on your table. We would like to have, uh, your uh, information, like your name, phone number, and email, so we can contact in the future for the future uh, lectures. Thank you. All right, one more thing um, before we start. So uh, Ramnikji uh, Singh uh, was born in New Delhi. So she was uh, introduced to basic instruction in Indian classical music at the age of six. Um, and there she learned about uh, Hindustani uh, Sangeet from diverse sources, observed uh, her maestros in her, her early years, and developed a personal interest in her approach to music. She started her formal vocal training at the famed Music Institute um, in Vidya Pit, New Delhi, where she acquired a bachelor's in uh, vocal music in 1998. Furthering her intimacy with Tala and Swara, she found the strict discipline and advanced training under the tutelage of Miss um, Amarjeet Singh in New Delhi, a uh, uh, senior disciple of the late Ustad Amir Khan. Um, and she also has taken instruction um, from Vin uh, Vinayak Tori, uh, Torvi, a disciple of... Um, Bhimshan Joshi and is currently a disciple of Baldev Raj uh, Verma, uh, a third generation uh, of Indore Gharana. Um, her 
soulful music uh, and talim uh, riaz combined with attractive style of presentation won her, has won her uh, many acclaims um she has a very unique style of rendering uh various forms of music she's uh, an exceptional uh scholar she's given no numerous concerts uh across the world she's originally from canada she's performed at mit in boston um in the united states um and the consulate general of india so we're very honored to have such an esteemed musician here uh with us uh, and will be helping us uh to learn more about um, Indian tradition and culture uh, through this remarkable medium. So thank you, Ramiji. Thank you for coming. A little bit about Rajesh, maybe. Do you have? Yeah. I don't. No, I'm have, sorry. Okay. If you want to introduce yourself, you're more than welcome to do that. Okay. Well, his tabla will introduce him. Okay, there you go. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much for thank that you. wonderful introduction, Dr. Uh, Akhtar. Um, it's just wonderful to be here. Um, my first time performing in Miami. Hopefully there'll be more. <laughs> uh, generally, I do have a harmonium player with me who accompanies, but uh, sort of a last minute thing couldn't arrange. Um, so I'll do what I can. Uh, there won't be a lot of harmonium playing, there'll be more singing. So, um, but um, what I feel that uh, the spiritual nature of music is not bound by any particular belief system, uh, culture, color, or creed. Uh, if created from the heart and with pure intention, it gets recognized universally. I hope everybody believes in that. So um, what I am going to be doing today is a few different kinds of genres, starting with classical and, uh, and semi-classical semi uh, genres, primarily meditative nature, and as I go along, I will be talking about uh, every piece that I will be doing. So um, with uh, much ado, I will be starting with a very uh, beautiful rag, evening rag called Rag Yaman, which uh, usually is like the starting point for any student when he gets into learning classical music. So Rag Yaman is one of those, uh, I mean, I remember learning it so many years back, but yet it is, so very new to me every time I try and sing it. And that's the beauty of Indian classical music, just to give an idea that it's all improvised. So I've never met Rajesh. Uh, this is the first time I'm meeting him and right on the stage. And we are just going to be making some music together. <laughs> Is it sounding okay in the house? Okay, okay. Ah uh, 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 u
So um, I do want to uh, do a particularly a beautiful rag called Make Malhar um, because actually this was like an indication to me that when I landed into Miami, it was raining like crazy with the storm and everything. So I thought uh, <laughs> I must do a Malhar prakar, which is a rag of the monsoon, primarily the rains. Um, in our Indian classical music, we have, uh, as um, we do different kinds of rags for the different seasons. There is a different rag called Basant and Bahar for spring, for, uh, you know, for monsoon it is, Malhar, Meg, Des, and so on. So, um, I'm also particularly interested to do Meg Malhar because I would like to talk a little bit about the Tarana vocalization technique that uh, was researched by my grand guru, Ustad Amir Khan Sahib. And uh, it goes back to the 13th century um, as, um, 
as, as written by uh, Amir Khusro Saab of the Sufi saint poet, um, he created the, the Tarana genre, which was primarily a very mystical, um, hopefully people can just not talk while the music program is going on, that'll be very appreciated. So, um, so in researching the origins of a tarana, he found that the creator of tarana was Hazrat Amir Khusro, 13th century uh, Sufi poet and musician. The mystic philosophy of Amir Khusro found expression in his tarana, which consisted of meaningful mystic syllables, the repetition of which helped in meditation. For example, Ya Ali became Ya Li while singing, and Ya Allah became Allah. Or O Dani, he knows, Dartan Tadim means come within my mortal body, O Lord. So after singing this Thai, the first half uh, in Amir Khusro's mystic syllables, Ustad Amir Khan Sahib used to sing Shares in Persian or the Rubais in Urdu or Hindavi, which had a deep philosophical significance. So I too follow this uh, Tarana technique and I have written some uh, of my own Taranas, uh, keeping that same thought in mind. Um, I will be doing one Khayal composition, which is in Drut, which is fast tempo. And uh, then I will be doing the Tarana. So Rag, Meg Malhar. Hopefully everybody will enjoy this. के सावन तुम हमारे नैन न बरसोर अब के सावन तुम हमारे नैन न बरसोर अब के सावन तुम हमारे नैन न बरसोर करत करे जवा निकासत ज्वाला कीनि कहे प्रीत अब के सावन तुम हमारे नए नए बर सोरे अब के सावन तुम हमारे नए नए बर सोरे करत करे Ha 
And if everybody can bring all their food and then come and sit and then listen. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Okay, and, and can I have some silence when I'm singing because it's very distracting and I just can't concentrate. I'm not doing my best. <laughs> I hope we can all uh, be focused on the music part now. Thank you. Appreciate it.
So, um, carrying on with uh, a different genre again, Shabad Gurbani from the Guru Granth Sahib, the Holy Book of the Sikhs. I will be doing one Shabad. Um, these Shabads are hymns or spiritual poems written by saints and mystics from different spiritual traditions of the Indian subcontinent and combined within one book called the Guru Granth Sahib. The Shabbats convey a deep message of truth. Uh, the Shabbats convey a deep message of truth and are sung with heartful devotion. They express the intense longing of the soul for union with the Lord. These songs of devotion are prayers that inspire the true seeker to turn inwards to contact the ultimate truth, the inner divine music that reverberates within every being. Uh, the meanings of these are very simple. If you know, you know, some Hindi and some Punjabi. Jiske sir upar tu swami so duk kaisa paave. So, you know, when Lord's hand is on your, uh, on your head, then you have nothing to fear. So, um, that's what uh, it says. <clears throat> I would rather be singing. Jis ke sir upar tu swami so duk ke sa paave paave so duk ke sa paave Jis ke sir Upar tu swami so duk ke sa paave paave so duk ke sa paave bol na jaane maya mad mata bol na jaane Maya Mad Mata Marina Chit Naya Ve Naya Ve So Duk Kaisa Paave Jis Ke Sir Upar Tu Swami So Duk Kaisa Paave मेरे राम राय तू संता का संत तेरे मेरे राम राय मेरे राम राय तू संता का संत तेरे तेरे सेवक को भोके चिना Jiske sir upar tu swami so duk kaisa paave Jo tere rang raate swami Jo tere rang raate swami तिन का जन्म मरण दुख ना सा तेरी बक्स ना मेटे कोई तेरी बक्स ना मेटे कोई सत गुर का दिलासा हाँ 
सो दुख कैसा पावे जिसके सिर ओ पर तू स्वामी सो दुख कैसा पावे नाम दियान सुख फल पायन नाम दियान सुख फल पायन आठ पहर आ सो दुख कैसा पावे जिसके सिर ऊपर तू स्वामी सो दुख कैसा पावे ज्ञान ध्यान किच कर्म न जाना ज्ञान ध्यान किच ज्ञान ध्यान किच कर्म न ध्यान किच कर्म न जाना ज्ञान ध्यान किच कर्म न जाना ज्ञान ध्यान किच कर्म न जाना सार न जाना तेरी सब ते बड़ा सतगुर नानक जिन कल राखी मेरी जिन कल राखी मेरी जिसके सिर ऊपर तू स्वामी सो दुख कैसा पा सो दुख कैसा पावे सो दुख कैसा पावे सो दुख कैसा पावे so um i will be doing a bhajan by kabir another sufi poet um kabir suggested that truth is with the person who is on the path of righteousness considered everything living and non living as divine and who is passively detached with the affairs of the world in this particular bhajan ghungat ke pat khol रेत तो हे पिया मिलेंगे ही सेज डू अ वे विद योर वेल सो घूंगट इज दैट वेल द इल्यूजन एंड यू शुल मीट योर बिलविड द डिवाइन लॉर्ड द लॉर्ड रिजाइड्स इन एवरी लिविंग क्रीचर 
Why speak ill uh, words against anyone? Flaunt not his wealth and your youth. Deceptive is your drum music that carries five notes. Shake off not your hope. Light a lamp within and illuminate this palace-like vacant space. In the colorful palace within, you can meet your priceless beloved only by perfecting the scale of meditation. Kabir says, by this practice, you attain supreme bliss that keeps the inner music chiming day and night. This composition has been made by myself. I've composed it in a very rare rag called Rag Bhupeshwari. It's been recorded. Thank you.
शून्य महल में ध्यान ध्यान शून्य महल में ध्यान शून्य महल में ध्यान बारीले आसा से मत डोल रे तो हे पिया मिलेंगे जोग जुक्ति से रंग महल जोग जुक्ति से रंग महल में पिया पायो मोल रे तो हे पिया मिलेंगे पिया मिलेंगे पिया मिलेंगे पिया मिलेंगे घट के पट खोल रे घूंघट के पट खोल कहे कभी थैंक यू कभी कभी खुद ही उसमें रम जाता है इंसान और फिर उसके बाद ऐसा लगता है कि बस हो गया आई <laughs> थिंक वक्त काफी हो गया एक पीस और करते हैं फिर ठीक है
So, um, my last piece. Again, um, a composition by Amir Khusro Saab. He used to write in Farsi, Urdu, and Hindi. And uh, a very famous Kavali of his, Chhap Tilak. So, I really enjoy singing. Um, <laughs> Well, the central theme of Kavali is also love, devotion, and longing of man for divine, for the divine. So um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard Chaap Tilak in many versions. Here is my version. <laughs> So uh, Khusro also wrote some Dohas. I will sing those first and then go on to the Kavali. So we need some energy coming from our tabla also. And uh, <laughs> जैसे हिंद जो पुत कराए कारने जल जल को Ba 
मत अगम कह दी नीरे मोसन ना मिला के छाप तिलक सब छी नीरे मोस नीरे मोस नीरे मोस ना मिला के छाप तिलक सब नीरे मोस नैना मिला के
छाप तिलक सब चीनी रे मोसे नैना मिला सब चीनी रे मोसे नैना मिलाए के छाप तिलक सब चीनी रे मोसे नैना मिलाए के नैना मिलाए के नैना मिलाए के नैना मिलाए के छाप तिलक सब चीनी रे मोसे चीनी रे मोसे चीनी रे मोसे काइंड ऑफ क्या बताइए बताइए वो बोली मैं गाती हूँ इसके बाद कुछ नहीं बनती दिस इज लाइक द अल्टीमेट दिस इज द ग्रैंड फिनाले आई वुड से दैट यस so much to uh, anu and pradeep for sponsoring the music i mean it's been really it really heightened and and really changed the dynamic of the lectures it was really wonderful to have that um again thank you to jerf uh to people like janet uh carlos and our it team uh all of the people pedro um david skip is here as well so many people that have contributed uh shekhar bai uh is here uh anjana all the people that are here that that have come we're really honored that you have helped to make our program so wonderful and we hope that you're able to stay connected and we'll hopefully see you again very very soon for all of our programming thank you so much